Hi, so my name is Rachel, and I'm VP Engineering for Currency Cloud. I'm joined by Liam, who is our development manager. Today, we're going to take you through the process of how we thought about building version two of our API. Um, but to start with, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to Currency Cloud. So Currency Cloud is an international payments company, and we try to make it easy for businesses to make payments across the world. We deliver our services primarily through an API. We're processing 40 currencies across 212 countries. We have 150 clients. Through them, we access half a million end users. And to date, we've processed $15 billion worth of payments. So this is a simplified diagram showing our application and services layer of our system. All of the heavy lifting is done by the services that make up Payment Engine 2. So these services include compliance, reporting, balances, transactions. Everything that's available through our API has a service inside of our payment engine. Now, this also includes our gateways, uh, being our fixed gateway and our payments gateway, which we build and maintain. Through our fixed gateway, we've got access to our liquidity providers, where we can instruct our foreign exchange conversions. And through our payment gateway, we connect directly into the SWIFT network and to various banking providers to be able to execute payments easily and efficiently. We've tried to wrap up all of the complexity around, around making payments into one engine that's easily accessible through our API, which sits neatly as a layer on top. Now, customers can integrate with our engine through the API directly, and the majority of our customers choose to do it this way. It gives them complete control over the user journey. But we do have other customers that like to use our user interface, which is called Direct. These are customers that are perhaps developer constrained, or they're just simply looking for an easy back office tool to use as part of their operations processes. So we already had an API, and what made us drive, um, what drove our decision to have a new one? So customers were already using this API, but we found that it was so tightly coupled to those internal, those internal services that I showed before that it was really difficult to make changes to either the services or to the API layer. We also wanted to incorporate some customer feedback, specifically around our error messages. Customers had told us they were a little bit difficult to use. We wanted our API to be really easy to use, really easy to understand, and really easy for us to maintain. Now, the second driver was also that we'd recently acquired our e-money license. This allowed us to hold customer balances, and we really wanted to put this forward into our product offering. But the, we would have to make this feature available through our API. Now, we couldn't just go ahead and change our API. You can't just change the contract of an API once it's in place. And we felt that the best way to go about this would be to embark on making a new version of our API. Hey, thanks, Rachel. I'm now going to spend um, a little bit of time um, going through some of the design decisions that were made when we were building API v2 um, before giving you a quick demo of the API in action. So hopefully what you can see on the screen now is um, an example of some RAML. RAML is a simple and succinct way of describing RESTful or REST-like APIs. Um, it's essentially a text definition of the API um, from which you can generate documentation, uh, client SDKs, uh, or possibly even the API server itself. We have used it for these benefits, but we've also found that it's been a really useful tool from a design aspect as well. Um, what it's allowed us to do is take a step away from um, the existing system and ask ourselves what the product should look like um, as an API. Um, any differences between the outcome of that and existing um, current system behavior have been abstracted away in, in an API layer. It's really important to spend time um, on the design of the API um, because you're often stuck with, stuck with the decisions you make for, for quite a while. Um, as Rachel um, referred to a little while ago, an API is a contract um, between yourself and your consumers, um, and you, you can't just change it. So if, if you change internal system behavior, you need to ensure that the, the API itself remains, remains consistent. At the same time as, um, as de de developing the RAML, we've also built our new front end, uh, which we call Currency Cloud Direct. Um, this helped us reinforce some of the API decisions that were made when we were building it. Um, and it also helped us to prove that the, uh, the API was easy to integrate with and also that the API was scalable. Everything you can see in Currency Cloud Direct um, can be done through API v2. 
Um, so it's a great tool to, to demo the, the power and the uh, functionality of the API. I'm now going to um, concentrate on, on one as aspect um, of, of what you can see on screen here, which is the balances that you see at the top of the screen. Currency Cloud allows you to, to fund multi-currency balances and from which you can make local and international payments. Um, and as I mentioned a little while ago, um, everything you can do here can be done via the API. So let's have a look at, at how you would do that. From the, um, the RAML that we've, we've generated, we've been able to create some interactive um, documentation, which is available um, on our developer center. So let's continue to focus on balances. So what you can see on screen now is the documentation of how, how you would retrieve a balance from the, from the currency cloud system. So it shows you the URL you need to hit, and it shows you the parameter that you, that you need to supply. So it's quite a straightforward API. In this case, you just need to um, pass across a uh, simple currency, and it will return you the, the response in the bottom. So let's actually, uh, let's actually give that a go. So let's type in US dollars, and let's execute. And what we will see is we will see that it's returned um, our US dollar balance, which is 100,000 US dollars. So that matches the US dollar balance that we saw in Currency Cloud Direct. So it's effectively just a different way of accessing the API. Integrating with APIs is great when things are going well, but it can be quite frustrating uh, when you run into, run into problems. Um, and we try to preempt that by uh, documenting all of the error codes that, that can occur. So we have a specific error code section in um, in Developer Center. So as I said, this is quite a, uh, quite a simple API call because it just takes a single, uh, single parameter. Um, and the only thing we can really do wrong here is to, is to supply an invalid uh, currency code. So as we can see at the top, if we do that, it will, uh, we would expect to receive an error message back saying it's an invalid currency. And we would expect to receive an error message code, uh, as you can see highlighted on screen here. So again, let's try that out. Let's type in an invalid, uh, invalid currency code. Let's type in ABC and execute that call. And what, we'll, what we will see there is the error code coming back exactly as we've seen uh, in, in the developer center. We've also taken it a step further than just the documentation, and we've uh, created a whole bunch of client SDKs. So I'm going to quickly demo to you now how easy it is to integrate with us using our Ruby SDK. All of our SDKs are available on GitHub. Um, so this is the Ruby SDK, but we currently also have them available in uh, Java and Python, and we've got PHP and JavaScript uh, SDKs coming soon. So it's quite straightforward to get started. You just need to install the Currency Cloud gem, which is available uh, on rubygems.org. Um, and then to get started, you just need to require the library, pass across your login ID and your API key, and then just tell us which environment you're using. So to get started with, you'll be hitting the demonstration environment. But once you're ready to go live, you'll, uh, you'll change that to start using the, the production environment instead. So it's really easy to get started. And let's, let's, actually, let's actually prove that. So what I'm going to do now is give you a quick demo of the, of the SDK. So I'm going to fire up, uh, fire up an interactive Ruby shell. And I'm going to require just a single file here. Uh, there's no magic going on in there. I'm just literally um, re requiring the library and passing across the authentication details. So let's file that up. And what we want to do is we want to just uh, find our uh, US dollar balance. So the class is called, um, is called balance. And there's a method called get, which takes a single parameter, which is the, the currency that you're interested in. So in this case, um, I want to get our US dollar balance. So it's basically that straightforward. So what you can see has happened here. It's returned a um, balance object with the, the currency and the amount. As I showed you earlier, we also um, show all of the error codes in uh, Developer Center. And we've also integrated that into the SDKs. So what happens when we type in an invalid currency code here? The system will return, and we can actually see the exact error message that's happened and kind of the advice on what we need to do to fix it. So in this case, the field has been supplied incorrectly as a currency, and that's because it's an invalid currency code. The idea behind this is that when you're integrating with the, the API via the SDKs, you don't have to keep switching between your developer environment and the documentation. You can try to sort of self-solve a lot of the issues um, directly from your developer environment. So I hope that was a, a really brief um, demo of how simple it is to integrate with Currency Cloud's APIs via our SDK. And I'm now going to hand you back to, back to Rachel. 
So truth be told, we didn't have all of these tools available as soon as we released version two of our API. We took a lot of time to, to engage with customers to find out which tools would be most appropriate um, and most helpful to them. That helped us drive uh, understanding which of the, which of the languages were most, would be most useful in the SDKs. Uh, we did know, however, that it would be very important for us to have a good migration guide up front, and that was available immediately. Between a good migration guide and enough support staff to help our customers migrate from version one to version two if there were any questions. Those were really important things for us. So there were two things that we learned um, throughout this process. The first thing is use your product. We really feel that by, de by developing direct at the same time as the API, we were able to find any logical inconsistencies in the product before our customers did. And most importantly, we could find any problems before our customers did. The second thing is just involve your customers. By speaking to them and understanding what their needs are, we really feel that our system's improved. They use your product daily and they really understand what's important to them and, and what, what fixes you might need to put into that. Our, your, your systems will definitely improve as a result and your customers do appreciate being involved in the process. Okay, and to wrap up, if you're keen to, to give the demo API um, a try, you just need to head over to the Developer Center, which is available at connect.currencycloud.com, and you can register for a demo API key and be up and running within a matter of minutes. Thank you for listening. Great stuff. Thank you, guys. Now we have a few questions. Um, you guys didn't do as good of a job sending questions, so if you do have questions right now, please send them to level two at findevor.com. We'd love to address those more. I do have a few for you guys, though. Um, first is, will there be a version three of the API? Great, so um, there's, there's no reason why we couldn't go up to a version three of the API, but we really feel that the only need to do that would be if we wanted to change what our product was offering. What we would like to do is, uh, is um, work with semantic versioning inside of version two of the API. If there's any contracts that need to change, we would rather up the minor versions. Great. Um, the second is, do you have a dedicated API team? Um, so we do have a team that is uh, dedicated as our implementation team. They do help our customers understand what's important inside of the API and how to integrate with it if they feel that any of the, uh, the, the documentation is not sufficient. Um, in terms of development, we don't have a dedicated API team. We prefer to make sure that all of the developers have experience across the full stack of our application. This way, the developers are exposed to absolutely everything, get a very good understanding of how the system works, and it also gives them the chance to experience all, the different, uh, all of the different uh, items from the fixed gateway all the way up to the API layer. Great. And um, how do you test the API? Okay, so we're primarily a, uh, a Ruby house. Um, so at the API layer, we test it mainly using VCR, which is a, um, a Ruby gem. It effectively tests the contract of the API. So you, in VCR, you create cassettes, which basically um, are mock objects of um, the responses that you would expect to get back. And then kind of we have a continuous integration pipeline that always tests that the response matches what we would expect to, expect to receive. Um, that's kind of how we test the, the API layer, the internal system. It's ob obviously covered by, by unit tests and uh, integration tests using Cucumber as well. Cool. Um, one final question here is, what advice would you give to somebody developing in this area? Um, I'm going to assume that that means the FinTech area? Yes. Um, so I think w one advice uh, about developing in the FinTech area is that it's really important um, to be not only secure, but also to be completely confident that what you're doing is, is correct. Ultimately, you're dealing with people's money and shipping money across the world. The last thing that you want to be doing is shipping it to either the wrong destination or in the wrong amount or in the wrong currency. It's really important to be completely confident that your systems are going to do what you instruct them to do when you instruct that payment out. So I'd, I'd say that the, the biggest thing um, in developing in the fintech space is just being confident that your systems are going to do what you think they're going to do. And I said that was the last question. We actually had a couple more roll in. Um, sure. Do you support any customization in case customers want special functionality in the API? 
Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, we try to make sure that the customizations are on strategy with what our product is looking to do. So if, if, if customers do come to us and have a really interesting idea that looks like this is something that we should, we should put into our roadmap, by all means come to us with those suggestions. Um, we do try to think quite carefully about what the strategy is. If we, we, we don't want to be integrating uh, specific requests if it's going to take us off of what, off of what our target is. Mm -hmm. And how do you communicate possible actions through API to UI layer? That is a very good question. <laughs> Could you repeat that? Um, how do you communicate possible actions through API to UI layer? I suppose one of the possible <laughs> actions that we do communicate through to the API layer is if you think about something like beneficiaries, where um, anywhere in the world there are multiple different ways of, tr of uh, of sending those payments out. And you'll need to have a variety of different information between IBANs, Big Swifts, address information, account numbers. And what we've done in our API is we've actually put together a reference, a, a, a reference section where you can request all of that information out that's returned, uh, it, that's returned with a JSON response up to the UI layer. What you can then do is interpret that to decide which fields you should be dynamically showing or not showing based on the based on the country that you're interested in sending. If that hasn't exactly answered your question, please come chat to us at the booth, because we're, we're happy to talk about tech all afternoon. So. Great.